Okay, great. So I'm very proud to present our first speaker to, uh, to the school. Um, Christopher Bishop uh, is uh, a Microsoft Technical Fellow and uh, uh, Laboratory Director. Um, um, sorry, Laboratory Director of the Microsoft Research Lab in Cambridge. Uh, he's also a professor of computer science at the University of uh, Edinburgh and a fellow of uh, Darwin College at Cambridge. At Microsoft Research, uh, uh, Chris oversees a world leading portfolio of industrial research and development with a strong focus on machine learning and AI uh, and breakthrough technologies in cloud infrastructure, security, uh, workspace productivity, computational bi biology and healthcare. Uh, most of all, I think uh, uh, the reason why I'm very excited is that uh, Chris is the author of one of my favorite machine learning textbooks. And uh, um, in fact, I was hoping to uh, have an autograph uh, <laughs> if the school was, uh, was done in person. Um, but um, yeah, I'm sure uh, many of you know the uh, pattern re recognition and machine learning book uh, uh, by Chris that has been uh, uh, the book of reference uh, for many of us uh, uh, throughout the years. And uh, so it's very exciting uh, that Chris will uh, open the school by delivering an introduction to machine learning. And uh, uh, yeah, I can, I can wait to hear this and uh, I'm going to really enjoy this talk. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, just check everybody hears me okay? Great. Yes. Fantastic. So, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, well, enormous thank you really to the organizers for the invitation to come and speak this morning and kick off this summer school. And uh, also congratulations to the organizers organizing an amazing summer school. It's a really impressive lineup of speakers. And I'm going to try uh, and rearrange my schedule a little bit this week and dip into some of the talks. It really does look like a, a fantastic week. So, uh, you know, a great privilege for all of us uh, to be able to participate in this. So a big thank you and many congratulations to the organizers. Uh, and especially on uh, hitting, hitting great levels of gender diversity and diversity generally, I think that's just super important for the field. And I'll, I'll even touch on why that's so important a little bit during the talk. Um, obviously, you know, if I'm brutally honest, I would rather be in the Mediterranean in the summer than in Cambridge in the winter. It's not quite the same. Um, on the other hand, the, the organizers told me yesterday that um, we have three times the number of people uh, attending as a result of going online. So there are some benefits to this, but um, uh, obviously in an ideal world, we'd get the benefits of both. So if you ever, if you ever do have a summer school actually in the Mediterranean in the summer, then I'd be more than happy to uh, contribute to that one as well. But meantime, it's a great privilege to be here. And um, I'm giving, a, in a sense, a very tough talk, Introduction to Machine Learning. Now, if I had all week, it wouldn't be quite so difficult, but because I've got an hour, um, obviously I can only really scratch the surface. So what I thought I'd do in this hour is just touch on a, a, a set of ideas which I think are interesting, stimulating, important, and uh, um, you know, perhaps set the stage a little bit for the fantastic speakers who are obviously gonna go into a lot more technical depth during the course of, of the week. But the first message I wanted to convey really is, uh, and this is coming from somebody who's been in this field for more than three decades now, is that this is an incredibly exciting time to be in the field. Although the origins of, of um, machine learning neural networks go back many, many decades, in a way this is, in many ways actually, this is a more exciting time to be in the field than, than ever before. And I'll just begin with one slide which just illustrates one aspect of that excitement. And that's the, um, my, yeah, that's a good start. Oh, try, there we go. Right, okay, so this is a graph from our friends at OpenAI, and uh, the, the, the font's a little bit small. If you can't read the details, it doesn't actually matter. What we have along the horizontal axis is date going from 1960 on the left all the way up to 2020 on the right. And on the vertical axis is the uh, number of floating point operations needed to train the state of the art in machine learning at that particular date. And it's uh, on a, an exponential scale, it's measured in uh, petaflop days, uh, petaflops per second times days. And uh, one is, uh, so the top is 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fourth petaflops per second um, times days. So this is sort of staggering amounts of compute. And what you see plotted here are the, the sort of um, state of the art machine learning models at different eras. You see the perceptron, something called NetTalk, TD Gammon. Uh, then we have deep Q learning, AlexNet, um, AlphaGo Zero, and, and a whole bunch of others. And what you see is that um, 
the, uh, these fall more or less on a straight line. So that corresponds to exponential growth. And that exponential growth has a doubling time of about two years. So what it says is that from the 1960s up till about 2012, machine learning, just like the rest of information technology, was riding this wave of Moore's law, enjoying this sort of doubling of compute power every couple of years. But some remarkable things happened around about 2012. And of course, this was the really the discovery of something which people have been trying to do for a very long time, which was to be able to train neural networks having many layers. This is really the deep learning revolution. And one of the things we discovered in deep learning is that in many cases, the performance of these systems gets better and better as we um, build out bigger networks, as we use more data, and all of that requires more compute. And so that's driven an absolutely extraordinary growth uh, in, in this curve. So if we look from 2012 up to the present day, again, it's a straight line, which means exponential growth. But the doubling time here is um, about every three and a half months rather than every two years. That means every year we're seeing a factor of 10 increase in the amount of compute you need to deploy to train the state of the art in machine learning. Now, I should emphasize that this is only certain kinds of machine learning models. If you happen to have a laptop and access to the internet, you can do fantastic research in machine learning, have a tremendous impact in all kinds of ways. This is simply the, the biggest models in the field at any one time. Um, but it really, is, it really is quite extraordinary. And what's more, this I think this graph is probably a couple of years old now, and this has continued to hold up to the present day. It's certainly gonna hold for the coming year. Um, of course, factors of 10 per year are hard to sustain. This is now costing tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of dollars to think about these very large models. Um, but the performance of some of them, particularly in the area of natural language, if we think about uh, the, the GPT language models, which have really revolutionized natural language processing, um, these are extremely large models. So let me just give you some, some numbers. So this, um, this is a graph, um, again, from OpenAI. Uh, and on the horizontal axis, it shows, roughly speaking, the number of um, parameters, uh, the number of ad adaptive uh, synapses, effectively, in, in different organisms. So um, we know that uh, the, the brains of um, uh, 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 brains are built of these uh, electrically active cells called neurons, and the neurons connect at junctions called synapses, and the synapses are adaptive. It's changes in the strength of the synapse, which are one of the primary mechanisms by which brains can learn. And so the number of synapses are roughly, in some rough sense, corresponds to the number of parameters in, a, in an artificial neural network. And along the bottom, you see the number of synapses in various organisms. And uh, in the human, it's around 100 around 100 trillion. Um, that's a pretty big number. And I've got a little illustration here to try to convey what 100 trillion actually means. So this is a picture of uh, South America. And uh, we've got the United Kingdom shown for scale. And the United Kingdom, uh, now we've had Brexit, of course, it's become detached from Europe and somehow drifted into the, the South Atlantic. There we are. It shows you just how big South America is. And the red line shows the Amazon rainforest. Now, the Amazon rainforest is massive. Of course, it's being destroyed at a, an alarming rate. But it is absolutely huge, I mean, vast compared to the whole of the United Kingdom. Now, the number of neurons in the human brain is of the same order as the number of trees in the Amazon rainforest. So it's a pretty staggering number. But what we care about, not so much is the neurons, is the synapses between them. And the number of synapses in the brain is roughly the same. It's the same order as the number of leaves on the trees in the Amazon rainforest. So it gives you a glimpse of just the staggering scale and complexity of the human brain, all running instantly on about 30 watts of power. So many, many, many orders of magnitude more efficient than our, than our best data centers. So uh, GPT-2, which was one of the breakthrough developments in um, natural language processing, had one and a half billion parameters back um, uh, uh, a couple of years ago and was the state of the art in terms of the scale, not just in terms of natural language performance, but also in terms of the largest models that we'd seen. Uh, an interesting question is when do we get to the same scale as the human brain? Now, it, it's only a somewhat interesting question because nobody believes that simply having a neural network with the same number of parameters as the human brain has any particular significance in terms of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, we don't, it's not just a matter of scale. Um, but it's interesting, the progress that we've made. And in fact, GPT-3 
um, which is um, one of the largest models trained so far, has 175 billion parameters. And so we're seeing this factor of 10 per year uh, continue to be sustained. And in fact, I'm pretty certain that this year, 2021, we'll see the world's first uh, trillion parameter neural networks for sure. So this is quite extraordinary and, uh, and, and really quite unprecedented. And it's just one of the many frontiers of machine learning that I find enormously exciting. Let me share another one with you, which is the, the fact that machine learning is also having tremendous practical impact on society. In fact, it's really becoming ubiquitous. Um, an area that I'm particularly interested in is the application of machine learning in healthcare. And I'm gonna just say a few words about this particular project. This is called the Antigen Map Project. And it's a nice example of how machine learning can have impact in the real world. And it also uh, connects nicely into, um, into COVID-19, in fact. So this is a project which was set up um, a couple of years ago. It's a collaboration between a company called Adaptive Biotechnologies, a, a company startup based in Seattle and Microsoft. And Adaptive, their, their unique uh, technology is their ability to sequence the DNA in white blood cells that codes for the receptors on the surface of the white blood cells, the T cell receptors, and they can sequence that DNA very um, efficiently. And um, the collaboration is to use machine learning to understand the relationship between the T cell receptors and, um, and the um, associated diseases. And I'll explain more about that in a moment. Um, this is a project we've been doing for a couple of years. We've been looking at various diseases such as Lyme's disease. And then of course, back in the spring when COVID-19 hit, we pivoted this project to focus on, on COVID-19. So let's just look at the adaptive immune system, uh, how it works, <laughs> the gross oversimplification, and then what machine learning can do to help. So if somebody's infected with the virus SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19, um, their body responds in some very complex ways and eventually, hopefully, the, the, their body is cleared of the virus. Now, what's going on there is, uh, as I said, extremely complex. Let me just um, describe briefly a few aspects of this. So one thing that happens is that some cells called antigen-presenting cells take um, some of the viruses and break them apart into small pieces and then present those pieces at the surface of the cell. And these, these things are called antigens. And then along come uh, white blood cells. There are various kinds of white blood cells. These yellow ones, CD8, are the killer T cells. And they, their job is to look at these antigens presented on the surface of the cell and recognize if one of them is foreign to the human body, if it's unusual, if not see, been seen before. Um, and uh, if it does, it undergoes clonal expansion, that is, it makes large numbers of copies of itself, and it does various things to go away and uh, attack the virus and, uh, and uh, kill it off. Now, how does it work in the sense of how can these T cells recognize something that your body has never seen before, because you've will never been infected with this virus before? Roughly speaking, when the T cells are made, they're, part of their DNA is scrambled up at random. And so they produce these little T cell receptors, the little semi-random um, detectors of semi-random sequences of, of amino acids. And they're then tested. So each T cell is more or less unique and it's then tested to see if it matches any of the sequences in the human body. If it does, it's killed off. And about half of all the T cells are killed uh, shortly after they're made. The rest are released into the, into the body. The thing that they're receptors are looking for are things which do not occur in the body. So if they find a match, it must be an invader, a virus, a bacterium, or, or perhaps even cancer. Now, there are other T cells as well. Um, these are the helper T cells. They also detect these antigens. When they find a match, they undergo clonal expansion. They uh, then inform other white blood cells called B cells to manufacture um, antibodies. So there are various mechanisms by which the, the, the body can respond. Now, what we've been doing in collaboration with uh, Adaptive, they're able to sequence these randomized sections of DNA that code for these T cell receptors. And um, looking, looking for um, invaders in the body is like looking for a needle in the haystack. But really what we're doing is exploiting this clonal expansion. The signal that your body has been infected or that you have a cancer um, is amplified by perhaps a factor of a million by this clonal expansion. So the signal to noise ratio is much higher if instead of looking directly for, for, for the, the cancer or the virus or bacteria, we look for the T cells. Now, the downside is those 
T cell receptors are sort of randomized. So we need to understand the relationship between the T cell receptors and the diseases they represent. And so the antigen map project is about using machine learning at scale, using Microsoft's cloud, Microsoft's machine learning expertise to learn the relationship between the T cell receptor sequences and the antigens and the disease. That's the antigen map project. And back in the spring, we pivoted this project to focus on COVID-19. And in a remarkably short space of time at the end of this year, uh, Adaptive Biotech, based on the, this analysis, was able able to announce the launch of a, uh, a new test for COVID-19 called T-Detect. Um, for people who have had infection and recovered, you can detect they've been infected by looking for antibodies. But the antibodies decay over time and the T-cells are expected to last much longer. So this is the world's first detection, the first test for COVID-19 that's based on T-cells rather than antibodies. And the uh, anticipation is that this will be able to uh, detect COVID-19 um, over much longer periods than antibody tests. So we're very excited about that. The other lesson from this is rather interesting is that one of the things the pandemic has done, one of the good things that it's done is really drive a, really an unprecedented level of scientific cooperation. So uh, not only did we pivot the project to look at COVID-19, but we also uh, launched something called Immune Race, um, whose goal was to uh, enroll thousands of uh, people um, in, in various categories of infection, currently infected, recovered, and so on. Um, and that data has been made um, publicly available through a, a project called Immune Code, and so therefore available um, to the community to do other great research on this work. So really very exciting. So I think this is another reason why it's just so exciting to be in the field of machine learning right now, because people are doing very practical things. And this is just one example of thousands um, that are having a real beneficial effect on the world. So with that sort of initial thought, um, I thought I'd turn next to ask a simple question, which is what is machine learning, since this is a machine learning summer school and this is the introduction. And I think if you asked, um, probably if you asked all the speakers at the summer school, what is machine learning, you'd probably get as many answers as there are speakers. Here are some of the answers that people might give. Um, you might say, well, machine learning, it's really advanced statistics, statistics with much richer and more complex distributions than statisticians have traditionally used. Um, uh, some people might say, well, it's really about pattern recognition, the ability to spot uh, patterns and trends in data and make predictions. You might view machine learning as some kind of biologically inspired approach to artificial intelligence. Um, or you may just be rather cynical and say, well, it's all just glorified curve fitting. Well, in a sense, all of these are true. These are all aspects of machine learning that you could say um, that, 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 are, that are true. But I want to give you a different perspective on machine learning, another viewpoint that I think is also true. And it's that machine learning represents uh, a transformation, and I don't use that word lightly, I maybe even call it a revolution, uh, a, a real transformation in the way we create software. Now that's important because virtually all technology today, from, a, from an electric toothbrush to a spacecraft, um, uses and to some extent relies on or critically depends upon com computation. And computation, of course, relies on software. Now, the way we create software is really transformed by machine learning. So um, it could be said that for the last 40 years, we've programmed computers and for the next 40 years, we'll train them. So we, instead of um, programmers having to devise a set of instructions which the computer can slavishly follow that will cause it to do the thing we want it to do, we do something very different. We write software, for example, neural network software, that might be relatively generic, not specific to the particular application we're working on. And then later we can train the network using, uh, using data in order to solve the problem that we're interested in. And it brings well, lots of advantages, um, huge improvements in performance in many cases, or allows us to solve problems that simply couldn't be solved using this handcrafted software. And this really is transformational in, in many ways, and uh, I, I'm not the only one to think this. This is uh, uh, the view of uh, Tim Kraska, who's a professor at, at MIT. Um, so he thinks about, he's really from the world of systems, and he thinks about the sort of the classical algorithms of computer science. These are algorithms, you know, for sorting and searching and routing and planning and so on. These are algorithms, very, very clever algorithms developed by smart people over many decades, but they have the characteristic that they're sort of one size fits all. They're algorithms that have good average case performance or have a bounded worst case performance or something like that, but they're developed in the abstract rather than for a specific application. 
what machine learning allows us to do is to build a solution for a particular application that's tuned to that application. Now that solution may be terrible on every other problem in the world. We don't care. We only care that it has good performance on the particular problem that it's tuned to. Uh, and his view is that uh, over time, the um, adaptively trained algorithms will replace many, if not most of these uh, classical approaches. So I thought I'd show you an example of how machine learning is used to tackle a problem which could have been done, in fact was done using more traditional signal processing techniques, but is now done using neural networks with significantly improved performance. Um, and this is a project which um, seeks to store data in the form of holograms. And I've chosen this project because I'm uh, somewhat familiar with it. It's a project which is being conducted in my research lab in, uh, in Microsoft Research in Cambridge, UK. Um, it's also um, a project that we've uh, become, uh, we've made public just in the last really uh, month or two. Um, it's been um, sort of under wraps, but we've made some very interesting progress recently and have started to talk about this publicly. And I think it's actually just extremely cool. We're, we're actually trying to store data in the form of holograms inside a crystal. So this is like, you know, something out of a science fiction movie, and I think it's a great project. But it's a serious project. The goal eventually, uh, if this is successful, is to replace the hard disk drives in our data centers. Now, uh, data um, is stored in data centers um, on, on disks. There are effectively two kinds of disks. There are um, solid state disk drives, which have the property of being very fast, they're very reliable, but they're also very expensive. Uh, so most data is stored on old fashioned spinning magnetic disks, which are a lot cheaper, but they're a lot slower because a physical read head has to move backwards and forwards. And because there are spinning parts and so on, they're, they're less reliable. So the goal here is to sort of get the best of both worlds, to have very high performance, uh, high speed, high reliability, um, but um, uh, at, at a cost that's uh, closer to that of spinning disks. So how does this work? Well, it uses a technology called a, an interferometer. So this is a sketch here. So on the left, you see a laser and the laser beam goes into a beam splitter and is split into two um, paths. So one of those paths is directed through some lenses onto uh, a screen. Now, um, this, the screen is where the, the data is encoded. And what's interesting about this screen, in fact, what's interesting about the whole project is um, the reason that we're exploring this and uh, the idea of storing data in holograms has been has been around for a number of decades, but it's never before been a practical technology. What is new is that things like this screen and as you'll see in a moment, the associated uh, camera that detects the, 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 the light at the end. Um, that technology has been revolutionized. It's been revolutionized by the development of the cell phone. So the cell phone, in your cell phone, you have an incredibly sophisticated, very high resolution screen and an equally impressive camera, but because it's mass produced, they're incredibly cheap. And so this holographic storage technology exploiting that, and this is the first part of it, this screen is essentially like the screen out of your cell phone and the data is written as an image on that screen and it modulates the the uh, laser beam, and that laser light is then fed into a crystal of lithium niobate. Now there it's combined with the, the reference beam, and with the, uh, the data beam and the reference beam meet each other, uh, there's interference and you have a spatial, spatially modulated pattern of intensity, and in the high intensity regions it promotes electrons in the uh, lithium niobate into, into uh, elevated energy states uh, in the form of a hologram. And so uh, in which the data is distributed, it's more like a Fourier plane, if you like, the, the individual bits are not localized, the whole thing is the data is distributed. And, um, um, and uh, um, that is non-volatile because the electrons can remain in the excited state, in a metastable state. Now, the other thing we can do is the, that reference beam uh, is bounced off a mirror, but this mirror is a micro uh, a mechanical mirror it's, um, it's a machine out of a, a silicon chip essentially, and it can be moved by very small angles, but at extremely high speed. And so the angle of the reference beam can be changed very slightly. And what that allows to do is to um, put multiple holograms overlapping within the same spatial volume. And so uh, that's how we store a hologram. And then to read the data back out, we just use the reference beam. So we send the reference beam in uh, by focusing at a particular angle, we can address the corresponding hologram amongst all of those holograms stored within the same spatial volume. 
Uh, so we get lots of holograms in the same volume. We then fill up the whole crystal with holograms in different positions like this. Eventually, uh, we can fill up the crystal. And then when we want to uh, erase the data, um, we just simply use ultraviolet light. It allows the electrons to relax the ground state. And then we have, um, and we can uh, carry on rewriting. So it's a, a non-volatile rewritable data storage system um, with some very exciting prospects, uh, which we hope one day will replace the disk drives in data centers. So what's this got to do with machine learning? Well, let's look at the data flow. We'll start off with some user data. This is, um, it has error correction added, of course, no system is perfect. So we need error correcting bits. Uh, it may be compressed and then it's stored as the hologram. We then read it back out using uh, that uh, reference beam laser using the camera. Again, the camera is like the camera in your cell phone. There's some uh, pre-processing applied to remove some optical distortions. Uh, that Those images then form the input to a neural network, a, a, a deep convolutional neural network, whose output is a, a probability distribution of the symbols. The symbols are little um, strings of bits. Uh, then the um, error correcting uh, algorithm can be applied to correct any uh, bit errors. And the result is the recovered user data. Now, um, the neural network here has to, it, this is a very challenging problem for machine learning because the neural network here has to have very high accuracy. Um, we, we would think of maybe 99% as being very high accuracy for a neural network in a task like this, but that's nothing like good enough. We actually need several orders of magnitude better accuracy. So it's an incredibly demanding problem for the machine learning but already the machine learning is doing a lot better than conventional signal processing techniques. So I would actually say that this project, we probably would have abandoned this project by now were it not for machine learning. Conventional techniques simply don't have the level of accuracy needed to solve this problem. So it's a very tough machine learning problem, but in some ways it's sort of an ideal problem for machine learning, because if you think about it this way, that user data, um, by the time it's been um, compressed, by the time it's been encrypted, um, it's essentially pseudo random data, both compression and encryption make the data look more or less random. And so we can simulate that data with a random number generator. That means we can generate arbitrarily large quantities of data essentially for free. Moreover, that data represents the labels and then the, we, in the laboratory, we, um, we store it as a hologram, read it back and we get the input, the corresponding input image data for the neural network. So what we have is perfectly labeled data. So we have arbitrarily large quantities of perfectly labeled data. Not only that, because it comes from a pseudo random number generator, it's not um, uh, personally identifiable data. We don't have to worry about GDPR. We don't have to worry about ethics or, or privacy. It's just random numbers. So arbitrarily large quantities of perfectly labeled data with no worries about ethics and uh, around the data or having to worry about um, uh, personally identifiable information and, and so on. So that's great from a, from a machine learning point of view. Now there's something else we can do as well, as well as using machine learning in that sort of uh, traditional supervised way, we can do something else. We can uh, compare the um, recovered data with the user data. That's, the, that's an error signal which drives the training of the neural network, but also it can drive the optimization of the overall system, not just the hyperparameters of the neural network, but many other parameters, physics parameters associated with the, uh, the actual process of creating and reading back the holograms. In fact, one of the interesting things about the project is that we have quite a high degree of automation in the laboratory so that sometimes people do need to go into the lab and change things, but a lot of the sweeps and the explorations of different uh, regions of the very complex space in which we can operate, those explorations are done in a semi-automatic or fully automatic way. Um, we use techniques like Bayesian optimization to explore that space in a, in a systematic way. So it's a really great example of um, machine learning replacing traditional signal processing techniques and leading to significantly better performance. Um, so what I want to do now is to just step back a little bit and look more broadly at machine learning algorithms. There we talked about one particular algorithm, convolutional neural networks. I think for, for the context of a summer school, and particularly for people coming into the field today, I think it can all be a little bit bewildering. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of terminology. There are many, many different algorithms. And of course, there are huge numbers of people in the field. I think there was something like 20,000 people registered for NeurIPS this year, double the number of previous year. Um, it's uh, uh, many, many papers are being published. It's a little bit, a little bit overwhelming. 
So I thought since this was an introduction to machine learning, I'd present you with a, a skeleton roadmap through the world of ML algorithms. And this is just my thoughts really over the weekend on what I would consider some core concepts, ideas that I think anybody in the field of machine learning really should be familiar with. Now, of course, um, no doubt you'll be specializing in some particular domain. Of course, you'll get a lot of deep knowledge there, and I'm sure you'll learn about things and use things that are not on this list. But this at least is my view of what I consider to be sort of core ideas for machine learning. Uh, and I'm sure this is very controversial, and I'm sure all of the speakers will have uh, their own list that will differ from this, and I'll probably have missed off everybody's favorite algorithm. But I think most people would agree that these concepts are pretty central to the field. So the first thing I'll say is that um, although it's not essential in order to use machine learning, especially with modern, um, modern tools, nevertheless, if you really want to understand machine learning, you do need some degree of mathematics. And, and the mathematics you need, there are really three branches of maths you need. It's linear algebra, it's calculus, uh, and it's probabilities. And what's interesting is this is not really the kind of maths that you traditionally see in computer science. So my background is actually in physics. I did a PhD in theoretical physics and I worked in theoretical physics for uh, uh, the fusion program for about seven or eight years before moving into machine learning. And that background in physics was actually ideal for machine learning. Um, traditional computer science is concerned with determinism and logic, whereas in physics, we deal with continuous quantities. So there's a lot of calculus. And of course, we're very familiar with the idea of uncertainty and probabilities are, are bread and butter to any physicist. So um, linear algebra, calculus, probabilities, those are the sort of foundation stones of, of the field in my view. So um, another core element to the idea of linear models, um, you can think of them as single layer neural networks, if you like, N for two reasons, really. First of all, from a pedagogical point of view, a lot of concepts can be understood in the context of linear models, which are just much simpler to analyze, much simpler to explore. But also, even in a practical application, if you can solve your problem to sufficient accuracy using a linear model, you're better off doing that than some big complicated neural network. There are so many advantages to linear models because they're uh, very easy to train, they're very easy to understand, to debug, to maintain, and so on. Of course, many of the interesting problems we, we want to work on can in no way be solved with simple linear models, but nevertheless, they're a good place to start learning about the field of machine learning. Then we go on to very complex nonlinear models, neural networks. Neural networks are really at the core of the, uh, of the field of machine learning. They were, when I moved into machine learning in the late 1980s, that was the, the second wave of excitement around neural networks. They kind of went away again, and they really went away because of the challenges of training um, what today we would call deep networks, networks with many layers. Um, uh, but around 2012 or so, uh, a number of breakthroughs allowed us now to train networks with, with, uh, with many layers, much richer architectures. And that really has propelled neural networks back to the core of the field. So concepts like back propagation or it's sort of generalization, which is automatic differentiation and the use of gradient techniques for optimizing these networks are, are clearly very central. We need to think about ideas of generalization. The goal is not just to fit data, but to make predictions. Um, so we can either view this from a, a what's called a frequentist point of view, bias and variance, or from a, a Bayesian point of view. I'll say more about that in a moment, thinking about how to uh, choose the right models. Um, and then this world of deep learning is incredibly rich and moving very fast. There are many concepts there, many new papers being published. Some ideas have emerged as being very core convolutions. I've mentioned already attention is a very important and, and widely used um, methodology, which seems to have a lot further to go. Um, but complementing all of that is a, is a viewpoint around um, a, a deeper understanding of probabilities. And so this is sort of taking us, I, I think everything up as far as the deep learning there is really absolutely central. Everybody should really know that. But um, there are other tools that you can have in your tool bag. And a very powerful one is graphical models. So graphical models, probabilistic graphical models can really be thought of as a way of getting insights and doing computation in models, uh, probabilistic models with, with more than a few variables. Once you start to have lots of variables, being able to draw graphs um, showing the relationship between those variables is very powerful, both in terms of designing models, in terms of understanding their properties, and even in terms of doing computation on the graphs in ways that are, that are very efficient. And uh, uh, another um, important concept in the field is that of latent variables, the idea of unobserved variables, which themselves have probability distributions. Now, in, in principle, all the parameters in a neural network would be latent variables and be described probabilistically. In general, that's computationally infeasible. But there are many situations where we want to construct models in which there are uh, unobserved variables um, 
either either which are either there as part of the modeling process or because they're quantities we care about and we're modeling our uncertainty in them probabilistically but uh, techniques like gaussian mixture models uh, which have discrete latent variables and principal components which have continuous latent variables uh, are good introductions to that that important branch of machine learning uh, we're also interested in um, doing not just point estimates of parameters but understanding probabilistically um, the posterior distributions over these latent variables so techniques like um, variational methods and uh, numerical methods, Monte Carlo methods. Again, useful, I think, for everybody in the field to have had some introduction to these and some basic understanding of what's, what's happened there, even if you're not using them in, in depth in your daily work. Um, there are particular techniques that are relevant to sequential data, recurrent neural networks, um, things like LSTM, uh, tension mechanisms are becoming very important in, in this area as well. Reinforcement learning is another whole branch of machine learning. Some of you will specialize in this, some of you may never use it, but again, I think everybody in the field should have under, some understanding of reinforcement learning, what, what it's about and, and what it can achieve. And then finally, another hot area in machine learning is causal inference. The idea of the, there being a difference between correlation and causation and really trying to understand causal effects in the world from observational data. This is hugely important in, in healthcare, but in many other domains where we want to make interventions in the world and we want to understand and be able to predict the, the effects of those interventions. So that's really just a, a possible skeleton uh, of um, um, core ideas taking you through the field of machine learning. There are many, many other things that, that could be added to this list, but I've tried to keep the list as short as possible in order to make it useful. So that's, that's one, um, if you like, little compass to help guide you through the field, particularly if you're a, a newcomer. Now, of course, I'd love to talk about all of these things in much greater depth. I, I don't have the time. So I'm just gonna say a few words about um, probabilities and why probabilities. And fundamentally, we have probabilities in machine learning, really at the heart of machine learning, because there's uncertainty. Everything that we do in machine learning involves uncertainty. We're trying to predict things that we're uncertain about. And, uh, so probability can actually be viewed in, in two ways, um, a, a more traditional way, which is in terms of the limit of an infinite number of trials, the frequentist point of view, um, the frequency of flipping a coin, for example. And there's a more general view of probability, which is as a, uh, a consistent quantification of uncertainty. So think, for example, of a coin. And let's imagine the coin is a bent coin. And imagine the physics of this coin is such that when I flip the coin, 60% of the time it lands with the concave side face up and 40% of the time it lands with the concave side down. Now, if I ask you to um, predict whether the next flip is gonna be a heads or a tails, and let's say you're a rational person, you're gonna make a bet on this, you don't want to lose money, then what should you predict? Well, given just the information um, I've provided, then rationally you would predict 50%. It doesn't mean that you think that the long run frequency of flips will be 50% heads. It's that you think it will either be 60% 60, 60 heads or it will be 40% heads. But because you don't know which side is heads and which is tails, that uncertainty um, uh, is, uh, um, uh, means that your, your rational prediction will be 50%. So you can think of the frequency of, of flips which turn up concave side upwards as being a frequentist um, probability, you can measure that by doing a large number of flips, whereas your uncertainty about which side is heads or tails is a, it's a Bayesian probability, it's either one or the other, it's not a repeatable event, but it's unknown, and so again you quantify that with probabilities. So we use this term probability to mean these two different things. Okay, um, just as a little aside, I thought I would just show you these in case you're not familiar with them. The, these, this is... Um, a nice way to understand that probabilities represent quite a different viewpoint from traditional logic. So computer science is, is really focused on trying to be deterministic, thinking of logic, thinking of everything as zeros and ones. Uh, whereas in probabilities, we think of numbers in the range zero to one. And that, that seems like a small change, but things can look very different in the probabilistic world. And this is a nice illustration of, of this. This is, these are called um, uh, non-transitive dice. So, um, they have a, a very curious property and they're just they're just regular dice but with unusual choices of numbers on the faces and they have the property that if you look at um let's say the yellow dice at the yellow die at the top of the picture if you roll the yellow one against the red one on the left two-thirds of the time the yellow die will come up with a higher number than the red die so the yellow will beat red two-thirds of the time now, it's the, the purple on the right-hand side will beat the yellow uh, two-thirds of the time. The green will beat the purple two-thirds of the time. 
and then remarkably the the red will be the green one two thirds of the time so uh, the, these are non-transitive um and that's or it seems almost paradoxical. It's not really a paradox. It's just a clever choice of numbers. And here's the here, here are the numbers. These are called Efron dice or, or non-transitive dice. And um, uh, and uh, you can actually uh, actually have some uh, here. These are um, our graphics designer rather brilliantly noticed that if you choose the right colors for these, you can make them in the form of the Microsoft logo. And we actually, uh, I, if I'm giving talks to kids in school and so on, I sort of hand these out and people can have a play with them and, uh, and, and actually see for themselves, they have this non-transitive uh, property. So this is um, just one illustration of, uh, of many examples of how probabilities can behave very differently from, um, uh, from um, regular deterministic uh, mathematics. So why, why probabilities in machine learning then? So let's look at um, an example of, it's just a hypothetical example of using uh, probabilities in machine learning. Let's imagine we have a, a classifier. We've got a medical, uh, an image of some kind in a medical context. And our goal is to classify this as either cancer or not cancer. So imagine we've got a deep neural network and we could train this up by supervised training in the usual way. And, uh, and hopefully that would be of value. We could also do this in a different way. We could take the same images, the same neural network, but instead we could train the neural network. Uh, and we could train the um, neural network to output not uh, this decision, but actually the probability of cancer. And then we could use that probability to then subsequently make a decision to decide whether this is cancer or not cancer. And the relationship between those, uh, oh, sorry, the first part of this is called inference. So going from the image to the uh, output probability, that's called the inference stage. And then going from the probability to the uh, classification, that's the decision stage. And they're related by something called the cost function. That's the, that just expresses the cost of making different kinds of errors, classifying cancer as normal or vice versa. Now, the second of these, uh, they both go from image to uh, a label. The second of these looks a little bit more complicated. So you might say, well, why would you do the second one of these? Why bother with these probabilities? Why not just directly make a decision? And some people have argued that we should always just directly make decisions. I'm going to give you, I think, six reasons why we should use probabilities. So the first is that the, um, the, the top approach is just a special case. So we can always recover that top approach. Uh, minimum misclassification rate, which is what we would train the top system to do, is just a special case in which we just have a simple uh, not one uh, loss matrix. So we always recover the standard case as a special case. But sometimes we have different costs for different errors. So for example, classifying uh, misclassifying cancer as normal would typically have a much higher cost than misclassifying normal as cancer. If somebody has cancer and they're, they're sent away, um, the, the cancer could get worse and, uh, and could have bad consequences, perhaps could even be fatal. Whereas um, if, uh, if uh, somebody who's actually normal is misclassified as cancer, it could be stressful. There may need to be some more tests, maybe some biopsies, but the cost is much less. So the cost matrix is very, very skewed. Um, moreover, supposing that cost changes, let's say the, uh, the, the, the follow-up test costs $1,000, then we're comparing um, the, the potential bad outcomes of cancer with $1,000, it's very skewed. But, but now imagine that somebody develops a new test that's only $100. Well, rationally, we should offer that test to more people. We should change the decision boundary. And the point is we can do that by just changing the cost matrix. It's literally one line of code. It's very simple. There's no need to retrain the neural network. There's no need to do that complex inference stage. Um, the benefit is that um, some classes are um, more common um, than others. So again, in cancer, if we think about a screening scenario, um, most people being screened for cancer will be normal. They'll not have cancer. And the problem with that is that if you simply train the neural network with data drawn from the, from the population, most examples will be normal. The classes will be very, very skewed towards normal rather than cancer. Uh, if the neural net just classifies everything as normal, it'll get 99.9% .9 right, but be completely useless. Um, moreover, to see a large range of examples of cancer, we need a vast data set, which may be complex to, to, to collect. Uh, and so what we want to do is rebalance, have perhaps equal numbers of cancer and normal for training, but then that will output the incorrect probabilities. But it's not a problem. We just use Bayes' theorem, again, trivial one line of code to shift and correct those probabilities. Again, no need to retrain the neural network. No need to retrain if the cost matrix 
changes. Another thing we can do is to uh, use what's called a reject option. So the, the neural network will make some errors, um, but intuitively we imagine the errors are gonna be made in, in uh, situations in examples, images where, where it's uh, less certain. In other words, what we can do is to, and this is uh, provably the correct thing to do, is to um, set a threshold on the probability. If the probability of cancer is below some threshold, in other words, if the neural neck is less certain that this is cancer, then you can, or normal, you can do it either way around, then we would reject those examples and send them to some other kind of classifier. For example, they could be given to a human being. So um, in a screening scenario, the role of the neural network might be to screen out 99% of images as very certainly uh, normal, and then the rest are sent to a human or to some other classifier. Again, no need to, to retrain the neural network if you change that threshold and therefore change the proportion of rejected images. Another nice thing is probabilities are sort of a, a, a kind of universal currency that allows uncertainty to be combined and manipulated. Imagine as well as this uh, medical image analysis system, we also have, let's say, a blood test. And the blood test, again, produces a probability of having cancer, and we want to combine them together to get more accurate predictions than either system alone. That's easily done. For example, we can use a little approach called Naive Bayes, which just combines those two probabilities again in a very simple formula. It allows you to take uh, uh, data from a, an image and data from a blood test and combine them together, but in this nice modular way that's e easily changed um, later if needed. And then finally, um, the uh, so-called activation function, the output of the neural network when it's a probability is differentiable. And so we can use gradient-based methods to optimize the network. So just some of the many, many reasons why probabilities are really at the heart of machine learning. And, and none of this is really, I've talked about Bayes theorem, none of this is really Bayesian. This is just the use of probabilities to quantify uncertainty on predictions. Of course, we can employ probabilities in a much richer way to quantify uncertainty everywhere in the parameters, the hyperparameters of the model. And that leads to the, the the Bayesian perspective on machine learning, which is a great intellectual foundation for machine learning and something that everybody should understand. Although in practice, especially with large scale models, it can be difficult or impractical to carry out the full paradigm of Bayesian inference. And so we make approximations. Um, again, because of this introduction, I'm going to recommend um, some books to read, and you could uh, read these books in conjunction with that little roadmap and then uh, work your way through this sort of core curriculum in machine learning. Uh, obviously, I'm hugely biased here. There's one particular book that I happen to think is quite good, and, uh, and, uh, and I would recommend this. This covers a lot of the material on that core curriculum. The main problem with the book, of course, is that it was published back in 2006, and, and a lot has happened since then, in particular, um, deep learning. So a lot, of, a lot of the ideas that are used in deep learning are covered in this book. Many of the developments of deep learning happened since the book was published. And so I'd also uh, strongly recommend the book Deep Learning by good fellow Benji and Corville. And this is a, a much more up to date book, uh, especially as regards neural networks and, and modern developments in machine learning. And those two books together would really allow you to cover the, the foundations of the field. And, and I would recommend them highly. I will recommend a third book. And in a sense, it's, uh, it, it overlaps strongly with the first two. It's a book by um, Kevin Murphy, Machine Learning, A Probabilistic Perspective. And although there's um, some degree of overlap and redundancy between the three books, I would actually recommend all three. And if you read something from one book and it's not quite making sense, you can go to a different book and read a different author's perspective and, and maybe the light bulb will go on at that point. Um, I want to talk very briefly about um, machine learning. Um, well, I've talked a bit about machine learning algorithms, but the other thing that's really happened in the field um, in, in recent years is that machine learning has gone from being a very abstract and intellectual discipline to being very practical. Uh, deep learning has really allowed us to build solutions in the real world, and we're seeing machine learning employed all over the place. And so it's really important to understand that machine learning today, and especially in the research world, is not just about developing new algorithms. If we want to use machine learning in practice, we need this much more uh, diverse set of skills. We actually need cross-disciplinary teams to come together to do more than just get a high score on the test set. If we actually want to deploy this um, in the real world, then we're going to need people from, from many different disciplines. And let me talk a little bit about one of these, which is, is the role of human knowledge and domain knowledge. So a lot of human knowledge is actually based on, uh, based on experience. So consider the example of a dermatologist. So a dermatologist can look at um, a lesion on the skin, and then they can say whether that's, um, they'll, they'll give a view on whether that's uh, cancer or, or normal. Now their, their diagnosis is based on lots of experience in medical school and then in clinical practice. Um, 
the, the, the challenge with that kind of, that particular kind of expertise based on experience is that's the same thing that machine learning is good at. Machine learning is good at looking at lots of examples and then learning to tell the difference. And so we've already seen in the case of dermatology that deep neural networks have reached the uh, same level of performance as the world's best dermatologists. And of course, the neural networks can carry on getting better with bigger models, better architectures, more data and so on, whereas the uh, expert humans are unlikely to get any better. And so it might appear that that kind of human expertise is, is going to disappear. Um, it, it, in a sense, though, what actually will happen is rather different. So it, it's been said that AI will not replace radiologists, but radiologists who do not use AI will be replaced by those who do. If you think about um, accountants used to spend their time adding up columns of numbers, then along came spreadsheets. It didn't cause accountants to disappear, but it did make accountants a lot more efficient. And, and no accountant today would work with pencil and paper. If they do, you should find yourself a different accountant. Um, so it's really about the, uh, the, the, the symbiosis, the relationship between um, humans and, uh, and machines, and for the foreseeable future, they will be very complementary. Mm. I've touched a few times on um, healthcare. I really want to finish in the last few minutes by saying a little bit more about the application of machine learning in health, because um, it's not only a very exciting area, it's actually a tremendously important one. This shows that uh, from the 1950s up to the uh, about five years ago, the proportion of public service spend in the UK on health went from about 10% to nearly a third. And here you can see in, in absolute uh, inflation adjusted numbers. Um, and this is true, not just in the UK, it's true um, uh, throughout um, many countries of the world that healthcare costs are um, increasing enormously and getting out of control. And it's not just the cost of healthcare, it's also the potential that machine learning has to improve health outcomes and to save lives. And so I'm really going to wrap up by talking briefly about uh, this project. This is a project in an eye, and I'll explain why I'm talking about this in particular in a moment. This is um, uh, concerned with precision radiotherapy. So it's not radiology, it's not about diagnosis, it's about the use of radiation to treat tumors. And a core part of that treatment pathway is to segment the tumor. So here is a, um, a radiation oncologist looking at a three-dimensional scan uh, from the patient, and they have to go through that scan slice by slice and using a stylus mark out the boundaries of vital organs and the boundaries of any tumors. And that can take anything from 20 minutes in the simplest case up to many hours. If a tumor is metastasized, there are many different blobs of tumor. Um, it can take literally many hours for the radiation oncologist to do that. And yet it's a very tedious and time consuming process. So we've brought uh, machine learning to bear in particular a class of uh, convolutional uh, neural networks called uh, UNETs, and you can just see the architecture there. And here are some results. And these are 2D slices here at segmenting vital organs. Here you see uh, an example from uh, a brain tumor, glioblastoma, where the tumor, in this case, an extremely nasty one in the brain, has been segmented in three dimensions. That segmentation, of course, happens extremely quickly. Now, the neural, what happens afterwards is that the segmentation is used for radiation therapy planning. So the radiation pattern is tuned to maximize damage to the tumor and minimize damage to, to vital organs and to healthy tissue. The, the neural network, however, is not doing the final segmentation. So the neural network produces a candidate segmentation and the radiation oncologist then goes through that slice by slice and checks that it's okay and will manually make any corrections that are needed. So the radiation oncologist still needs to go through the slice, still needs to sign off that segmentation, but it now takes the minutes rather than hours. In fact, in a, in a controlled study, the uh, time saving is, a, is, a, is uh, it's reduced to 13% of the, of the normal time. So it's sort of an order of magnitude, more than an order of magnitude, uh, in fact, reduction in the amount of time that it takes to uh, produce a segmentation. That's the total end-to-end -end time on the part of the oncologist. So for oncologists who spend a significant amount of their time doing this, this is um, uh, tremendously exciting. And uh, this is uh, Raj Jenner. So he's our uh, main collaborator. He's at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge in the UK. We collaborate with a number of hospitals around the world. This is our main collaborator. And the reason I'm very excited about this is that this is now being used in clinical practice. So Addenbrooke's has uh, announced that they're now going to be using this um, for all their patients, initially in head and neck, and then rolling out to other cancers. 
and we'll be looking at working with other hospitals and rolling this out there, hopefully in the near future. So very exciting because this is not just about good performance on the test set. This is about using this in clinical practice, really improving the, um, the lives of the clinicians, but also being able to treat patients faster and in cancer treatment, uh, faster treatment uh, generally results in better health outcomes. So with that, I'm, I'm more or less out of time. So I'm just gonna wrap up with a few final thoughts. First of all, as I've tried to share with you, I think this is a tremendously exciting time to be in the field of machine learning. And I think that excitement is gonna be with us for decades to come. So I think for those of you who are master students, PhD students just going into the field, this is a tremendous time to be in the field of machine learning. Um, one of the reasons is that there are many opportunities for societal impact. It's not just about the pace of advance of the technology, it's about the opportunities to have um, uh, practical impact in the real world. Applications of machine learning are not second class citizens. Don't, don't think that the only valid research is some fancy new algorithm. Using machine learning in the real world is just as important, if not more so. Uh, and my final thought, and I think this is probably the most important thing that I have to say, is to be thoughtful about how you use machine learning. You and, and your peers in the years and decades ahead will be the people who will create new generations of technology and deploy it in the real world. Because it's so powerful, because it scales, because it's ubiquitous, um, you will have a tremendous influence on the world. You have a lot of responsibility. We all do. We have collectively have a great responsibility. We must be very thoughtful about how we use machine learning and make sure we use it for the betterment of society. Uh, somebody once said, just because something can be done doesn't mean that it should be done. Thank you very much.